Good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to our Global Perspectives on Race and Racism speaker series. My name is Dr. Jair D. Harrington, Assistant Professor in the Black Studies Department at UIC. I will serve as moderator for today's talk, Black Feminist Disability Studies meets Hip Hop Feminism in Janelle Monet's Dirty Computer, Professor Anna McQuan Hinton. Here's the rundown of today's schedule. First, I will provide some background about the series. Second, I will introduce our speaker and she will share her presentation. And last, we will have open Q&A where comments in the chat will be acknowledged and you can also raise your hand so that you can dialogue with our guest and then we'll forward to the afternoon. But before we begin, I would like to offer some background about the series. And today is our final installment for the semester. With support from the programming committees in the departments of Latin American and Latino Studies, Sociology, Global Asian Studies, and Gender and Women's Studies, the Department of Black Studies has been hosting the Global Perspectives on Race and Racism Speaker Series for Fall 2023. This interdisciplinary series has featured scholars with expertise across the world to address the global socio-historical, economic, and systemic effects of racism. These events have provided multiple perspectives through which participants can explore the global dynamics of racism. We have seen that the phenomenon of race not only intersect with citizenship, belonging, and constructs of the nation state, they also commingle with class, gender, sexuality, and ability. This series has highlighted race and racism from a variety of disciplinary perspectives and geographic. And now I will introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Anna Laquan Hinton. Dr. Anna Laquan Hinton is an assistant professor of disability studies and black literature and culture in the English department at the University of North Texas. She has published on disability regarding constructions of black motherhood, masculinity and hip hop, Faces of Incarceration, Reproductive Justice in Literature, and African and Afro-Diasporic Spiritual Practice as Technology in outlets including the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, the CLA Journal, as well as the Cambridge Companion to American Literature and the C, and the Palgrave Handbook on Reproductive Justice and Literature. She is currently writing her monograph, Refusing to be Made Whole, Disability in Contemporary Black Women's Writing, which approaches conversations of aesthetics, spirituality, representation, community, sexuality, motherhood, futurity. Dr. Hinton is also Public Relations Director for the College Language Association, Forum Executive Committee, TC Disability Studies, and a member of the Committee for Persons with Disabilities for the City of Benton and the State of Texas. She is a disabled, queer, mommy, black feminist who loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit, loves love and food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, and striving to loving herself regardless. The floor is yours, Dr. Hinton, and we look forward to your time. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm using my office desktop and we don't get along. So <laughs> I'm glad it's working for everyone. Um, I just want to thank um, Jaira and Akimi and everyone who has been instrumental in my being here. And I will get started today. Um, I'll be talking about Black Feminist Disability Studies and hip hop feminism, um, specifically through an analysis of Janelle Monae's um, visual album, Dirty Computer. <clears throat> Excuse me if I um, have to clear my throat, I have a cold. So right now we are in a moment for Black women. Um, specifically, this moment is epitomized by Janelle Monet and her success with um, her most recent, recent pleasure tour. She is broken out as a, as a defendant um, and a symbol of Black women's sexual freedom, a queer icon. Um, she is receiving all the love and 
praise that she has deserved. Um, Monet has been in the public eye for quite a while now. Um, as an artist who defies genres, as an artist who is bold, who bends gender norms, who resists the, 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 the normalizations about women's bodies and representations in the industry. And yet she has undergone a, a progress, a growth and development in her own personal image that at times confounds um, her fans and critics alike. And so when I think about Janelle Monet's career, I think about key questions in critical disability studies and hip hop studies. Um, specifically, I think about the role of affect. I think about the position of women. And I think about the legibility of women artists and MCs. Um, Janelle Monet is celebrated for her genre bending and, and breaking and exploding music. Um, and she's often given accolades by hip hop performers, but she's not always considered a, a hip hop artist, although you'd be hard pressed to find a song in which she's not dropping bars. And so I want to think about her visual album and particularly the new sonic spaces that's heavily influenced by funk and punk, um, a little bit of R&B and definitely hip hop and the kind of Afrofuturistic world building um, that she's doing in there and how her music and her image really does try to resist binaries such as good, bad, um, hegemonic, subversive, and specifically how a hip hop feminist met with a black feminist disability studies lens can open this up. So hip hop studies scholarship um, has largely focused on male rappers, my work included. <laughs> um, and in an earlier essay, I talk about black men, mental disability and vulnerability and, and how those moments of vulnerability are illegible. Um, but women are non-binary cultural producers are often absent from these conversations. Um, and why? For one, despite the narrow effective space afforded to black men in society, hip hop has been a space that has given black men an opportunity to be open about their psychic vulnerability. Granted, it has to be articulated with an improved, or with an approved forms of hip hop masculinities. Yet women have yet to be allotted that same psychic freedom. Um, but this too could be a presumption. And so I'm really interested in what happens when we peel back the layers of performance um, and how a Black feminist disability studies informed hip hop feminist analysis opens up and expands our readings of Black women's bodies and hip hop performance. Um, and so hip hop feminism emerges as an intervention in this very gendered masculine space of hip hop studies, um, largely accredited with hip hop journalist and now scholar of black women's pleasure, Joan Morgan, when she published, When Chicken Has Come Home to Roost, a hip hop feminist breaks it down. So I remember when I first saw When Chicken Has Come Home to Roost, this is before I was officially a black feminist, I was like, Chicken, what? what is this? At the time, chicken heads was a derogatory um, word attributed often to black women um, who were sexually promiscuous, um, typically associated with giving oral sex to men all around. And so I was really interested in what this person was writing about that and what a hip hop feminist was. And at that time, Morgan's book was so groundbreaking for me because in many ways it expressed why at that, that age when I was young, um, why I had not explicitly identified as a feminist. And in the book, Joan Morgan gives us a provocation. Um, she says that she needs a feminism that is rooted in Black women's 
everyday experiences, their experiences in their day-to-day lives one that is not siloed um, or reduced to the interests of Black women in the ivory tower of other public intellectuals, one that's willing to sit with and wrestle with uncomfortable questions such as, and here I'm quoting Morgan, suppose you don't want to pay for your own dinner, hold the door open, fix things, move furniture, or get intimate with whatever's under the hood of a car. Is it foul to say that imagining a world where you could paint your big brown lips in the most decadent of shades, pile your fat ass into your favorite micro mini, slip your freshly manicured toes in four inch fuck me sandals and have not one single solitary man objectify, I mean, roam his eyes longingly over all the intended places. It's like a total drag for you. Here, Morgan is asking us to consider the ways in which at a certain point in time, dismantling the patriarchy is not always <laughs> ideal. It presents a world where certain desires, problematic and contradictory as they may be, are still present. And one in which women and many black women for whom she's attempting to represent in this work Um, still desire. And so she declares that she needed a feminism brave enough to fuck with the grace. And this was not my foremother's feminism. And so in this text, Morgan is responding to and feeling constrained by the second wave and at that time also third wave feminist movements, um, even Black feminist movements, um, once again articulated and practiced by academics and intellectuals. And so for many young folks today, Um, it's hard to understand how subversive Morgan's admission was for the time. Feminism has somehow come to mean women's rights to do whatever the hell they want to do, (laughs) Um, even if that so-called desires patriarchy and misogyny ventriloquized through lipstick lips. Um, And in many ways, it's easy to conflate Morgan's um, um, articulation of hip-hop feminism with this anything goes feminism. However, it's important to note that while Morgan wanted a space for Black women to express their desires, even if they perpetuate the patriarchy, she was nevertheless clear that some of these desires did indeed perpetuate the patriarchy and weren't inherently liberatory. These are the tough conversations in which she's trying to um, think through and push us forward. Um, Anyway, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Feminism has come to speak for, hip hop feminism has come to speak for black women and girls who don't embody or perform respectability, who are often dismissed and concerned with a feminism that, um, who are left out because they're poor and don't identify as feminist. Hip hop feminism is concerned with a feminism that speaks to everyday black folk. Similarly, black feminist disability studies as articulated by scholars such as Moya Bailey, Sammy Schalk, and myself is seeking a a critical disability studies lens that can fuck with the grades of the everyday lived experiences of Black people, and particularly Black, sick, and disabled people. It's a approach to critical disability studies and to our culture and life around us that can hold in tension the need to view disability as a celebrated um, identity, but also come to contend with histories of racial and gendered violence that create debilities that may cause people to disidentify or be hesitant to identify as disabled. It's an approach towards disability that recognizes that for some disability is um, access to economic resources without necessarily demonizing that, but at the same time can critique how disabled family members as crip hop artists, um, Leroy Moore contends, sometimes use and misappropriate financial resources from their disabled family members while keeping them marginalized and isolated. It's a feminist and disability studies perspective that can reach into history and recognize how the lived experiences of black women as oppressed by misogynoir throughout the diaspora 
is deeply rooted in histories of ableism, such as the, <coughs> excuse me, the experiments done by J. Miriam Sims that now found our present day practices of gynecology. And so in many ways, a black feminist disability studies perspective is also seeking a way to deal with contradicted, contradiction and speak to the everyday lived experiences of black women and not just to those who are in higher education or the ivory tower. However, Janelle Monet is neither obviously disabled and as I mentioned before, nor is she considered a hip hop artist. And I have lots of thoughts on these and we can talk about that later. Um, as I said, she defies genre and she must deal with the misogynoir that marks black women as less than beautiful. Um, however, her artistry is celebrated for its refusal to be categorized. And she is lauded as beautiful and habits most embodied markers for privilege. She's young, thin, and, and blessed. she's curvy. She got body, um, she's buxom. Um, so then what sense does it make to approach her work from a hip hop feminist, black feminist disability theoretical perspective? It doesn't, at least not at the onset. But throughout the rest of this talk, I will outline how crucial these interventions from black women thinkers are to unpacking the nuances of Dirty Computer and Monet's public persona. And so we'll start with this first section that I call, Let's Get Dirty. Um, and to understand uh, Janelle Monet's current place, it's important to talk about where she's from. Um, and how she started out in her transformation. So early, in the early part of her career, Janelle Monet paid homage to the everyday folk. So very much aligning with a hip hop feminist understanding um, of to who we are speaking and writing for. And we see this, and I'm about to share my screen in her sartorial choices. And so earlier on in her career, she was known for her black and white suits and her um, unrelaxed natural hair pomodor. And when interviewed, she claims that this particular look connected and rooted her. And here I'm going to start quoting Monet. It's a dedication to uniformity, and I'm a minimalist by heart. But if a lot of it had to do with me wanting to have a uniform like the working class, like my mom and my grandmother. My grandmother had 16 sisters and brothers and they all had to share one pair of shoes. And so that's the family I come from. I don't ever want to be detached from that. I use it as motivation for my music and just to keep me centered, grounded and to stay on message. And this is important because many fans and critics praise Monet for the, her choice of dress. They, they praise the reference to her roots. They thought it was cute. And most importantly, they praise that she didn't use sex to sell her music and boost her image. Feminists praise, Monet, feminist praise for Monet's work was rooted in respectability politics contradictorily or presently, these same folks have been recently clutching their pearls as Monet parades the TV and internet showing her areolas and to quote Joe Morgan, her fat ass <clears throat> in wife beaters wet and tied up so that they're cropped or no top at all. Um, and Daisy Dukes, pum pum shorts, short shorts, however you wanna to refer to it. Um, and so for many, this is a drastic, stark, and sudden change from her earlier image, and also a cop-out. They view her new image as buying into the hypersexualization of Black women's bodies. These folks clearly have not been paying attention to her personal image, especially in her visual, emotional film, Dirty Computer. So while in Dirty Computer, um, no nipples slipped or a flashed. By the release of this album, 
Monet had integrated color into her wardrobe. She wore short shorts, crop tops, weird pussy pink, chap like pants, as you can see here in the um, upper left hand corner. Um, heels, blowouts, braids, and various manners of Afro futuristic puff puff hairstyles. The monochrome that had once marked her allegiance to her working class roots were now aligned with hands made tail S groups seeking to purify and reprogram the minds of dirty computers. Thus, the plot of the video on the visual album. In Dirty Computer, um, you have the protagonist, Jane, who has been taken by this uh, radically right group um, as a person that they reduce and call a computer. And specifically, this computer is dirty and must be reprogrammed. This narrative echoes um, the reprogramming uh, work done against queer kids. It hearkens to conservative religious discourse. And it is a dystopia that is rooted in the oppression of women, particularly black women um, throughout. And so within Dirty Computer, Monet emphasizes that it's an emotion, an emotion film. And once again, this connects to this idea of making black effective space and however the way that she deals with affect diverges from black men in popular hip-hop music because rather than relying on violent fantasies of lashing out um of the the really dark um, psychic landscapes of those who are severely depressed and oppressed. Within Dirty Computer, we see a world building rooted in contradiction and grace, in pain and in pleasure, in Black joy and liberation, as well as Black repression and oppression. And so now to discuss what does disability <laughs> it has to do with this, right? And what does um, hip hop have to do with some of the, with much of the songs that I said are, are largely pop and funk influenced? So, as I said in, in my very brief summary of the emotion film, um, Jane, the character that Monet plays, has been identified as dirty. Um, and the film is a process of accessing her memories and deleting them. So besides the, the interesting dynamics of having black, I mean, white consumption of moments of black joy that are then erased and no longer accessible by the black female protagonist, what is crucial in understanding this dystopic space that Monet is describing are histories of <clears throat> eugenics that's rooted in racism and ableism. At the dawn of the 20th century, eugenics ideology um, was common and celebrated and was at the core of much scientific and philosophical and political discourse. Um, quote unquote, pseudosciences such as phrenology was used to articulate why black folks and also disabled folks of all races um, were subhuman and would bring the race of humans um, altogether backwards and must be eradicated. And while eugenics discourse has fallen out of favor, at least explicit discussions of eugenics discourses have fallen out of favor, um, Disability studies scholars quite aptly articulate how they remain, whether that's in our practices of genetics testing, picking and choosing whether or not you want to be able to have children who have Down syndrome, for instance, 
Um, even now you can pick um, attributes down to sex, eye color, hair. When very much rooting that in continued ongoing eugenics discourse, um, this time housed in the fields of medical technologies in service of futures or ideal futures where disability is the marker as Alison Kafer argues a feminist crip queer um, of whether or not we have progressed. The absence of disability marking the most ideal future. Um, and of course, as disability studies scholars um, contend, one, this is not to attack um, reproductive rights or birthing rights, um, even though some critique of eugenics um, from disability studies scholars have uncomfortably <laughs> been uh, appropriating, co-opted and sound a lot like those who are on the right and fighting against reproductive justice, but to be more aware of the ideologies that inform our choices. It's not to say that um, a future free of debilitating violence is an ideal, but to warn against viewing disability as produced only by violence and not also a natural variation of human embodiment. And so in Dirty Computer, when they're going through and erasing memories and in many spaces through that access and erasure of memories, what Monet presents as the core of the self, that is very much rooted in a eugenics ideology. The, they get to pick and choose um, which aspects of the self, of the Black femme self, are worth retaining and those which must be eliminated in service of a progress towards a better society. Additionally, um, discussion of dirty echoes to, um, to derogatory conversations around disability, queerness, blackness, and stigma. Um, and especially when we think about in the hip hop years and in a lot of earlier hip hop, discourse black women as dirty, whether they have dirty pussies for um, being too sexually promiscuous, whether they're doing men dirty by being conniving and scheming, um, an identity that's now being embraced, and we can talk about that a bit later, um, and et cetera. So this, so this discourse of dirty is also infused with those histories and those cultural contexts. And so in many ways, Dirty Computer is um, this critique, this very complex critique of respectability politics and a reclaiming of getting dirty, of holding on to all of the complex aspects of our being that make us who we are. So in many ways, Dirty Computer is also a cultural product that emphasizes that we fuck with the grays. Um, it resists binaries of gender, sexuality, and genre. Throughout the, emo to, the emotion film, or the emotion picture, as Monet calls it, you see um, Monet playing with gender, leaning into hyper femme identity, as we see in videos such as Pink or The Way You Make Me Feel playing with her love interest, going back and forth between um, a love story of, between her and Tessa Thomas um, and another gentleman that's also in the, in the film, even suggesting that they are in a polyamorous <laughs> um, relationship. You see her also playing with the genre of not just music that is her choice, um, the sonic landscape of Dirty Computer changes drastically over the course of the entire motion um, picture from the pop sounds of a pink to the funk, very much Prince inspired sound of the way you make me feel to the more hip hop oriented sound um, of um, Django Jane and I like it. <laughs> in, in Dirty Computer, you see 
Monet articulating an artistry that refuses to be siloed and, comp and compartmentalized. And in many ways, the drama, or in some cases, melodrama, I mean, sometimes I like the acting <laughs> is a little bit over the edge, but it's cute, it is what it is, um, rests in a system that insists on observing and categorizing people and that easy access and labeling of folks that is also rooted in ableist ideologies, the desire to diagnose um, and correct and fix um, people and to reduce them to these diagnoses and to cardin off and treat people and treat conditions according to lists of so-called symptoms. And we see this throughout the film. However, there comes a moment where the two men who are going through Jane's memories um, hit a snag. One, he starts to emphasize, wait, this isn't a memory. What is this? And then this guy like, just delete it. And it continues to happen. And here, once again, the binaries between what's memory, what's world building, what's fantasy, what's desire, comes undone and begins to merge, emerge. And we see the conflict between every between Black women's everyday lived experiences, and that is both as um, women, as racialized subjects, and as embodied subjects, versus the neat categories that society, particularly a sexist, ableist, capitalist society, would have Black women remain in. Um, Nevertheless, and despite this question of whether or not um, he's deleting a memory or something that is inarticulable um, and other, they go on and delete it anyway. And here you have um, such an essential critique of how eugenics logics works in the everyday policing of Black women's lives and bodies. Um, whether or not the observations that they have of these bodies, of these personalities, of these figures um, are accurate and fit within the neat constructs, they're still targeted nevertheless. And in many ways, these scenes of the men choosing to delete the memories or whatever they are is an apt metaphor for the conundrum Black women find themselves, even when what we present as unintelligible to society, it still becomes up for attack. We see this throughout the world building that Monet presents, and particularly um, as she goes into a Black hip hop feminist critique in her song, um, J um, Django Jane, of Black hip hop masculinities. Um, uh, I thought I had the slide with the image for that, so I apologize. But in Jingle Jane, um, this is the one song that's constructed completely um, out of, as, a, as a rap verse. Um, and the imagery within Jingle Jane um, very much echoes that of Black power movement. And it's also a little shady towards like the Nation of Islam um, as well. And so here within this song, Monet is giving a Black feminist critique of um, hip hop and the masculinist and masculine um, overrepresentation within the field. And for calling and creating through this call a black feminist world where you where men are forced to move back and sit down and as she says let the vagina have a monologue and throughout you see the contrasting images of the black women um, wearing their all black outfits um, once again echoing to the black power movements 
um, as both casting shade and critiquing those moments. Um, some parts, they have that and their little kufis that they're wearing and it's quite comical. Um, but others also as viewing it as empowering. It's also important to note that within this particular um, section of the film, Monet has gone back to her roots in the suits. However, she's gone back with a difference. Um, instead of returning to her black and white, she is dressed in a maroon. And so here we see her engaging in that tension of trying to access and make space in a genre that is quite hostile to women, particularly women um, who don't fit a certain script. And from there, I wanted to talk about the world building. Indeed, what Monet is most celebrated for is her Afrofutuous world building that has been a mainstay of her career since she's come out. Um, and for many scholars, they focus on her interactions with technology, um, with the idea of being a cyborg, being an um, android. For me, however, I'm really interested in how her world building speaks to hip hop feminist futures and disability futures, um, and specifically dystopias. Throughout um, the film, we have contrasting images. One of her within the detention center and having her memories removed, it's sterile, um, it's infused with both a throwback to really repressive images of women, like in the white dresses and the headpieces, but also highly futuristic with representations of advanced technology. Um, here in the film, you have um, Jane on the machine, the device that they hold her onto and, access, and they use their technology to access her memories. And then you have um, one of the workers there, formerly known as Zen, one of her former levels standing in front of her. Um, and in many ways, this hostile space echoes common celebrated images in science fiction um, depictions. And Monet truly exposes how those normal images within the science fiction genre are rooted within patriarchy, heterosexual, heterosexism, and ableism in her representation of them as spaces of surveillance and erasure. These images are then contrasted with those that are in her memory. There, the colors are bright. Um, there are various spaces of black joy. In several videos, she's partying with friends. She's going on high speed chases. She's dancing. She's embracing lovers. Um, and specifically, she's engaged in an all black world building in which I read through Kevin Quashie's theory of black aliveness. <laughs> Whether the images are evoking black punk, rock, hip hop, the jungle, the city, desert spaces with weird pussy pink chap-like pants. It's a world inhabited by black people. Um, black women, black femmes, black men as well, black non-binary folks. And it's a world that includes both black joy as represented in the scenes of them laughing, drinking, dancing, kissing, um, fucking and being joyful, but also black pain as Jane and her friends are being chased and hounded down by representatives of the, the state. Um, the militaristic state. What's important and key to realize in Monet's world building is that it is not idealized. It really is rooted in the lived experiences um, as well as the, the desires and fantasies of her Black femme identity, but also the realities of misogynoir and anti-Black violence are ever present, but never overcoming focus. Or rather, I take that back, not never. And so I want to end my discussion 
by going, um, by reading the end of Dirty Computer through um, a Black disability studies lens, um, specifically that of Tari Pickens. So by the end of Dirty Computer, instead of Jane and Zen escaping and reclaiming their memories, Jane has been fully corrected um, and is now also used as an apparatus um, for um, extracting memories um, and turning others who have been identified as dirty computers um, into reprogrammed beings. And for me, the ending echoed what um, Tari Pickens has theorized as the aesthetics of Octavia E. Butler, um, a pioneer of Black women's Afrofuturist visions um, aesthetics. So Tari identifies three main components of Butler's aesthetics. One, open-ended conclusions that frustrate the narrative cohesion and then um, intricate, two, intricate depictions of power that potentially alienate the able-bodied reader and three, contained literary chaos that upends the idea, the idea of ontological fixity. Within this ending, we see a world building and a vision of futurity that's rooted in an embodied experience that is neither able-bodied or white. Our desire that she's able to run off with Zen into some other world is frustrated in many ways that the genre, um, the, the, the allusions to melodrama would have us believe otherwise. Throughout the film, there are intricate depictions of power. Um, the, 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 the tension um, of rep between representing black joy yet black pain um, as constantly uh, fluctuating states of experience leaves viewers uncomfortable and their experience of that black joy constantly disrupted. And finally, there is this sense of contained chaos throughout the entire film, the going back and forth between the memories and the sterile um, space of the cleansing location, um, and specifically um, a critique of ontological fixity as Monet underscores our current relationship with technology and enfleshment. Um, one way in ways that call into question um, the futuristic celebrations of the integration between human matter and technology. Um, here it's important to remember that the people didn't choose to become computers. They were ascribed um, the moniker of computer. Um, in many ways, or in, uh, as a new vision of older power dynamics to name black bodies as something other than. And so as a film, as it dives into affect, what we get is not so much an expression of Monet's affective or psychic space or her persona's psychic space, but a film that makes viewers feel all the feels. Um, and here I'm alluding to work that I'm currently working on, on Black queer affect and the language that Black folks use to talk about affective states, these, these very much um, ambiguous, um, seemingly unclear yet very specific phrases such as um, in your feelings, such as I feel some type of way and feeling all the feels that we use to talk about different um, and sometimes contradictory affective states within the same phrase. And so she very much goes against what we typically think about as the masculinist um, effective space that's allotted in hip hop, the one that has become the center point in hip hop disability studies, and therefore makes this a co-collaborative, and to use the language of pop psychology, a co-regulatory space where 
we are both experiencing her feelings, but also our own um, feelings at being interpolated into this psychic space. And so here in Dirty Computer, Monet gives us an opportunity to look at interventions in scholarly thought, in this case, hip hop feminism and black feminist disability studies as not just useful for thinking through and considering specific identities, um, though they are definitely useful for that. Um, and I will never suggest that we decenter the, the, the place of Black women and femmes and non-binary folks within those discourses, but also to reveal how they allow us to analyze and deconstruct larger ideologies that inform our present, but also our future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Henson, for offering us this perspective so that we can understand dirty computer. And um, the links to Black futures, Black women, non binary people, femmes, and queer worlds are transparent in the work. Um, but your insight using a Black disability studies lens gives us so much more to enrich our experience with this emotion picture. So thank you for your insights, and we greatly appreciate it. So now we'll open up the floor for any comments or reflections on what you just heard, any questions. So please um, lift your voice with the microphone or uh, offer some comments or questions in the chat. Right here asks, do you have a favorite you know, Monet song? Oh, goodness. So I'm one of those people that hates answering favorites questions because I'm so undecided. Um, and also, like, I'm a hardcore hip hop fan. So, like, my favorites aren't always the ones that she celebrated <laughs> for by others. Um, but I loved when she released Queen. I loved Electric Lady. I went to a HBCU, so that paired with the video was giving me all the feels. Um, I actually really enjoyed Jingle Jane. I was like, okay, I see what you did there. Um, the way I feel like the way you make me feel like that one was great because I loved Prince, and I was like, okay, I see what you did there. Um, so I I don't have a favorite. Um, like I said, admittedly, I'm really attracted to the sound when um, the songs um, that most closely echo traditional hip hop and R&B because I'm basic, but <laughs> or like funk, but yeah. So much for that. Any other questions? Yvonne. I don't know if this is a if this is a question more or less just a statement that presentation was absolutely wonderful I'm so glad Brianna sent me a backup email to make sure I join I just saw Janelle Monet in concert with my daughter and you know the Aragon Ballroom wasn't a, a big enough space for artists like that and what she brought to that space and it was nothing but liberation, I felt. This was my first time like witnessing her work and how you just explained it, you know, with your own intellectual thought. It just really had my brain ticking and saying, what did I witness? So now I got to go back and listen. I did record some of it. But the intersect and what it is that you're saying, you know, it makes me more aware of who I say I am too. And, and that's why I join these conversations to continuously learn how we can connect each generation to the music and what we're experiencing from it. 
thank you. No, thank you so much. I so appreciate that. Oh, goodness. And yay for you getting a chance to get to the concert. The way my life with these kids and these finances are set up, I did not get there. So I'm happy for everyone who was able to. <laughs> a good question. Um, great presentation. I'm really intrigued by this new emerging art of visual albums. Uh, and wonder how you think they're changing the music industry, especially in the genre of hip hop. That's a great question. It's one that I'm actually exploring in three, all three of the classes that I'm teaching this semester, um, and each one will be watching a visual album. And two of them will be watching Beyonce's Lemonade, and in one um, we'll be watching Dirty Computer. And in in many ways, it's important to think about the culture of videos, um, how they were before, especially when um, MTV and BET were at their height, there were countdown shows, you had to be there and you were able to see visual elements um, of an artist's work, but they were really discreet. They were made for singles. There was lots of money um, thrown into them and they were really much promotions for larger albums. Um, but in, in but they didn't necessarily represent the entirety of the album because they were really focused on singles. Um, while people are definitely putting out videos today, um, you don't have MTV, BET, and if you were really pressed VH1 <laughs> to turn to to access the visual elements. Um, it's funny because I often forget to look for videos unless they're really out there hardcore promoting their videos. I don't, I don't know, there's a visual to a lot of the newer artists. Um, I do find that the more established artists use it, they use the visual album to, to really put what they're putting out into conversation. Um, and, and it's particularly the visual aspects that might get lost in require and in, in when you're using social media to promote the visual elements of music. Beyonce changed the game when she dropped Lemonade. And this is not to say that she was the first person who did the visual album. I had to bring it back for my students. I was like, even when Michael Jackson did that Moonwalker, <laughs> like the what? I said the Moonwalker. I was like, that was weird. <laughs> but it was a visual album, right? Um, in many respects. Um, and I see it allowing them to play with creativity I also see it putting a lot of pressure for some folks who don't have the chops um, to, put, to use and engage this kind of genre. Um, and so I am curious to see how the long form of an entire kind of film um, begins to fit in or, or can fit in with the immediacy and the short form culture of like TikTok videos. We are now at the point where if your song is over two minutes or your video is over 30 seconds, you're not getting a full view. And so, um, whereas, you know, in, in 2016 and that era, this was, this was really great. Um, you know, you got to get that HBO title and sit down through this. Um, I do think it would be, and I don't, I'm not sure if they're going to have the, the strongholds, um, that I think many people thought they were gonna have because of how social media has shaped um, our engagement uh, or our attention spans rather. So I don't know if that answered your question, but those are just some of my thoughts and the questions that I have. Thank you. And also, I guess you can turn into a polling film um, that we've been seeing with artists uh, taking their promotion of tours to um, to movie theaters now, and we're seeing that a little bit more frequently, um, even with the Renaissance tour that has been a part of it as well, um, different kind of promotion. Not sure if we're actually getting the visuals that we saw in the um, early trailers, but you know, we'll see. Um, Sam says, this makes me think of when MTV made Carmen a hip hopera in the early 2000s, finding hip hop's place in a greater art world. And that was also um, a Beyonce phenomenon. Y'all, I wanted so much from Carmen. <laughs> 
I want it so much more. Um, <laughs> Oh gosh, Beyonce, she can act her ass off in a four minute video. Oh, but back then a movie was challenging, um, which also makes um, the choices that she made in Lemonade um, really interesting because there, was, there there isn't that plot that you would see like in a traditional video in the 2000s for um, per se, um, or even in like that hip opera, the hip, the hip opera. So we'll see. Um, and I love that you brought up like the, the, the feature film, like, you know, um, when Homecoming came out, I was like, whoo, I can't wait for this Renaissance film to drop. There are people who are about to sit their hind parts in for that Taylor um, Swift film. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that goes um another interesting counterpart um if this is what you're into was um Kid Cudi's Intergalactic um it was a cross between like a full-length romantic comedy and a, vi and, and a visual album and it was beautiful and it was dope and it featured tracks from whatever album he was dropping at that point um as the score, but it also had a full on plot. It's animated. It's just, it's dope. I will give him that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, would you like to speak? Uh, oh, no. I just saw the comment. I was like, and it was. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, any others? Any other comments? Yeah, um, something that I thought of definitely, um, and you, you brought it home with how it is that artistry in particular, hip hop, um, black art, the kind of music that um, Janelle Mohene has that traverses different kinds of genres, different kinds of um, ways of experiencing the emotions that she has um, on the tracks. Something that I thought of immediately is just that the kind of expansive nature and the kind of vision of her mind. Um, Yvonne mentioned that seeing her, the art Aragon Ballroom, seemed like it was too small to contain the bigness that she has. And something that I noticed um, as well with this film, and even as we're talking about the genre of visual albums, is that you kind of have to have a big budget to do it. Um, it, it did not look anyways, kind of cheap. Um, it, it looked like there was definitely a budget. Um, and so there's, there's a way that this kind of way of storytelling um, may only be accessible to a, a certain kind of artist with a particular sort of investment. Um, and so what does this mean for the kind of expansiveness of storytelling if it's kind of limited by, um, let's say, budgets or maybe the direction that um, the music industry is headed. So could you speak to that um, kind of emergent artists and the kind of, uh, you, uh, the kind of challenges that, that might exist for creating um, in this particular way? That's a great question. Um, and I think it does speak to uh, what I was saying um, in the sense that you really do see established artists um, as the main ones making this kind of full length future film uh, version of their albums. There used to be a time in, in music video production where if you were a new artist, you would still get the huge budget um, invested in your single and the visual aspects of your single. Um, we don't really see that <laughs> these days at all. And so I imagine, um, and what's interesting though, in terms of uh, visual culture um, and the ways that it works with the oral, the oral culture, and especially on social media, you do see a lot of new artists relying on their fan bases that they're establishing um, and the visuals that they can offer, whether it's through stitching together um, uh, TikToks, whether it's through dance crazes um, and you come to know visually the music through the fan base before they even release a video. Um, 
And once again, this is still within this very kind of short form culture of like the two minute um, TikTok. And for y'all who haven't realized it, when they say like they're doing the clips and they're going to release the full track, the track is like two minutes and 10 seconds. So <laughs> still short. Um, but I, I, I do, I, I think they are leveraging that. And I am more so curious than having answers of what that looks like for up and coming artists. I just don't see them having um, that access. I will say these babies, they can put together a film on YouTube with a Timu microphone and an iPhone. So you never know. The sky is the limit. Um, another uh, maybe another direction that we could take is again looking at the evolution of Janelle Monet, and so now um, moving in the direction that we are now with her current um, tour and her most recently released album. That she is in an age of pleasure. Um, there's this emphasis on pleasure and sexuality and the kind of freedoms um, that she wants to explore, not only in her music. Some people have noticed that the uniform has changed um, quite a bit, um, as you mentioned in your presentation. So could you speak a little bit to um, how it is that a Black disability feminist or Black feminist disability lens could help us um, to think through these new iterations of um, her artistry and her work and her message. Yes. Um, like I said, what I've thought has been interesting about um, especially critical responses are like, oh my goodness, she's like turning into a hoe now to sell her albums. And they had a similar reaction when Beyonce released her self titled album and she was more explicitly sexual. And it really goes to demonstrate how little attention <laughs> society and culture pays to Black women. Um, and I think this speaks to her desire to um, push boundaries and binaries um, because no matter what you present out there uh, or these artists put out there, they do end up going in a box. Beyonce has been singing about sex and her man maybe not as explicitly for a long time but if you listen to crazy in love y'all y'all already know speechless was was where it was at right um and so on um and while you know yonsei and partition might be a little bit more in your face than what you imagine this is this, this has been part of the evolution it's, it's been moving there and i think the same thing with janelle monet and that's what i find dirty computer really interesting because i i see it as almost a bridge um, as her moving, not necessarily out in a way, I don't think she's dropped um, those roots of the suits and the pomodors, but um, as a bridge to where she was going in, in this life. Um, and so when I think like a Black feminist and a Black feminist disability studies um, theoretical lens um, brings to the table is this idea of transformation of identity and embodiment as fluid and ever-changing um, and as in constant flux. Um, and you see this with her persona um, evolving uh, very much uh, in a way that echoes her um, late mentor and inspiration prince. Like. <laughs> and even in the maturation of her own body. It's like, girl, where'd you get those from? And, and, and what does it mean to like move into like a grown woman figure and to become comfortable in those bodies? Um, immediately, I, I think of this in conversation with Chloe and Halle Bailey and how uncomfortable um, their development main folks uh, from the embodiment that they represented, not just in their curated image but in their actual physicality as adolescents to come into their grown woman <laughs> excuse me hood and so that that black feminist disability studies lens really asks us to think about bodies as changing but also to think about the narratives that we ascribe to black women's bodies and the tension between navigating those narratives, but also the desire um, to self-define and how that looks kind of messy because them, them Bailey, them Bailey 
sisters is messy. Beyonce's messy. Um, Monet's really interesting because she's she's been very private. Um, and so I got the feeling she's messy too, but we don't got all the deets of how. Thank you so much um, for that, that insight. Um, and so as we close, maybe you could speak a little bit about the future work that you have um, and how it may integrate into this conversation where we can look forward to um, see, see your work at, that's on the horizon. Thank you, thank you. Um, so my book is now under contract with a university, Mississippi Press. So hopefully we'll be wrapping that up and seeing that before tenure in the next couple of years. Um, I'm still regularly publishing. I just now have a contribution in the Rutledge Handbook to Literature and Social Justice that just has come out. I'll be having a contribution to the Cambridge Companion to <clears throat> Um, literature, the Black Body in Literature, um, that'll be coming out next, early next year. Um, and I'm currently working on my uh, second book project um, that's in early phases, but I've started presenting um, work on that at ASA and WSA. I'll be presenting work um, on that at the upcoming um, MLA. Um, and that book is thinking about a disrespectability politics and, um, Black negativity. And so I'm really interested in the the figures who refuse to be redeemed. <laughs> uh, and even as much as we try to find them subversive and liberated, they always, the, the messy figures um, and what we do with that and thinking about that also in terms of Black affects, um, particularly those messy Black affects. And so, yeah, I've been presenting, like I said, um, on that currently and getting feedback on that work. Yes, and we look forward to that mess. So long, thank you so much for such a wonderfully um, insightful presentation. Um, super engaging. Um, we appreciate your time, your efforts, um, and we appreciate the kind of work it is that you're doing. These kinds of intersections, as we know, we've been speaking about this in, through this entire series, um, are not always so uh, deeply highlighted. And so we appreciate the kind of ways that you are you walked us through um, thinking about um, Black feminist disability studies and how it is that their application can be made. We're observing culture when we ourselves are participating in um, the kind of emotional worlds that are built for us through arts in particular. So thank you so much for what it is that you've done for us today. Um, so this is our last talk of the semester. We appreciate your time and intention uh, throughout this semester and um, we appreciate you being here with us. So thank you everyone for coming um, and wish you a wonderful day and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Take good care. Thank you.